Muses of Mythology is a spoiler-heavy podcast. That's an understatement. We're going to discuss not just the events of this book, but the Rydenverse as a whole, and really anything that we feel is relevant. You can find full spoiler warnings in the show notes. So I, I, I bought a pretty bad uh, thesaurus today. Not only was it terrible, it was terrible. <laughs> Why? I'm just trying to kill the silence? A little bit. You're listening to Muses of Mythology, a podcast where we explore how ancient myths have become part of modern pop culture through the lens of Rick Riordan's Magnus Chase and the Gods of Asgard. This is Story 86, Hell. I'm your co-host and podcasting muse, Darian Smart. Joining me is my co-host and brother, DJ. How's everybody doing today? I'm DJ the Muse. And recently, I have been doing the uh, New York Times crossword. Oh, the mini one? No. Oh, the real I, I, one? I paid for it. Oh. Yeah. How's that going? It's actually a lot of fun. Yeah. And some days, you're just like blasting through. You're like, oh, yeah, word, 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 uh-huh. word. Other days, you're like, what do you mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, Turned I... out to be gasp. Oh. Hated okay. it. Yeah. Yep. Have we evolved past the connections? Uh, became... I'm still doing it. I yeah. still do it every single day. I do every single thing on that app every day, dude. Interesting. Everything. I do the... tiles. I check out Spelling Bee. All of it. My problem with tiles is that they just repeat so quickly. Like, there aren't diverse enough patterns. And I got Some of them are the fucking hard, though. Yeah, like weird. that like weird uh, 60s Art Deco one. Yeah. That one was funky. Wild. This is not sponsored by the New York Times no. games, if only. No. Um, I think we should discuss this more, um, but let's muse around the garden for a moment. DJ, guess what I found? What'd you find? I found a new patron. Oh, really? Well, I guess I've got a push They notif- came to us. It, yes. I got a push notification on my phone that told me we had a new patron. Mm. It's Dalton Montgomery. Oh, nice. Yeah. DJ Thank you so much. I have yeah. met him. Yeah. You know Dalton. Yeah. He's been in our house. Yeah, he has. <laughs> this is my friend Dalton. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you so much, our new podcast hero, Dalton. Yeah, we appreciate you. Mm-hmm. You have access to the Discord now. Yeah. You'll be able to see uh, plenty of uh, memes. Also, all of the bonus episodes, including the Remith episode, uh, the upcoming one in which Dalton will actually be on. There you go. Where I invited Dalton over so we could discuss Song of Achilles. Yeah, absolutely. I am not there. Because I had not listened to it. No, it also was the Pride episode, so DJ wasn't invited. Yeah, yeah. But if you've been waiting for us to discuss Song of Achilles and were frustrated when we did the Achilles episode and Darren had still not consumed Song of Achilles, sorry, do you want to give us money to listen to me <laughs> talk about it? It was great. It's available now. It will be available Friday. Nice. I haven't edited it It's available it now. It's not, DJ, it's, it's not. Now, Stop telling them Go that. to our muse, <laughs> patreon.com forward slash muses mythology. You will find Song of Achilles eventually. Yes, if you listen to this <laughs> literally Friday after it comes out or any other point in history, yes, it will be there. Uh, also there, tons of other bonus episodes. 100%. Mm-hmm. Very, very fun ones. 86 bonus. There's just as many main feed episodes. There are Bunker 9 bonus episodes, including one where we recently ranked the Hades character designs based on vibes. That was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I promised at the top of that episode there would be no spoilers. And then about halfway through, I accidentally got a character design spoiled for me that I was so into that I demanded we discuss it multiple times throughout the remainder of that episode. It's so. a really cool character design. When I saw it, I'm like, this is one of no, the coolest designs incredible. in this whole it's like inc- whole series. That's maybe going to be number one design when I, we finally get around to ranking the Hades 2 character yeah. designs. Oh, yeah. Easily. Easy S tier. But thank you again, Dalton. We appreciate your support. Dear mm-hmm. listeners, if you want to get in on that insane amount of audio we have, DJ said it earlier, it's over on Patreon. But also, thank you all just for listening, for talking about the show with your friends, for interacting with us on Instagram. Honestly, it means the world to know that anybody's out there listening. You're all our favorites, but the patrons are just a little bit more favorite. <laughs> now, back to the show. Okay, DJ. What's up? I... Need to go downstairs and get my Magnus Chase book. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Yep. I needed it because today we're talking about hell. There we are. She appears one time in the Magnus Chase books, and I wanted to be able to reference that. But technically two. Technically two? When's the second time she appears? Uh, nine Realms. Oh, right. Uh, that <laughs> one's also downstairs. <laughs> Don't worry, I remember a majority of what happened in that one. No, me too. 
And that one's actually... Oh, no, I should go get Ship of the Dead, too. Is she there? Well, she's not there, but you hear the spirits of, like... Mm, the underworld. Magnus and Alex both hear the spirits of their loved ones calling out to them. Mm. <sighs> what also happens in the second book. No. The very end. No, it's the very end of the third one. They're trekking across. Isn't it? It's also at the end when Mal- when uh, Magnus is trying to get Uncle Randolph from falling, and he can hear the souls from below. Right. He hears them down there, and then it reappears. <sighs> Maybe I should go get those books. No, it'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> DJ says it's fine, we, everybody. We just said exactly. That what, is big. Yeah. I, don't, I guess I don't have to cite that one. This one has hell a specific description and a little yeah. bit more. So, okay. Uh, we're talking about hell. DJ, huh. what do you remember about hell from the Magnus Chase books? It's been a minute since I've listened to Sword of Summer. Mm-hmm. I know she's her design in this one is split in half. Yes. Great. One's more normal. The one looks like a decayed corpse. Yep, yep. Okay. She is not evil per se, but not good either. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just one of those kinds of characters. And I don't remember what she does. Well, the answer well, she's is... She's the, the god of hell, right? Yeah, yeah, Helheim, yeah. right? She's the but, leader But, but what she but, does in, in Magnus Yeah, I, the answer, Offers her mom's soul, I Yeah, guess. yeah, basically. The answer to that question, Gigi, is basically nothing. <laughs> she nice. does basically nothing. She shows up, antagonizes Magnus, like, Magnus, like, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Uh, she appears... Actually, no. I didn't listen to this part of the book. It was in that last hour That's of the That's right, listening. and you hadn't finished it. <laughs> I still haven't. That's fine. We finished doing them all now. Yeah. Yes. That's why I really couldn't think of anything. I'm like, her design is split in half and That's I why think like, half what? zombie. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, maybe? It's... So mm-hmm. since I've thought about this part, it's been about three years. Maybe four. That's fair. So uh, I was worried for a second because I'm flipping through. I'm like, oh, gosh, where? What chapter was that in? How am I going to find it? Fli- oh, it's uh, chapter 58. What the hell? <laughs> so, <laughs> there it is. Good job, Rick. I'm not mad about that. Classic. Uh, it's He very much enjoys being able to do that kind of humor. Yep. Uh, they uh, appear in Midgard and Magnus isn't separated from his companions, which just kind of happens. Usually it's just for a convenient one-on-one villain interaction. Yeah. And we don't need the rest of the crew there to distract. You could do that for a dream, though. Mm-hmm. So he appears on Bunker Hill, and there is a quiet monument, a gray obelisk that is the, you know, Civil War monument in remembrance of those who died. Yeah. A voice at my shoulder said, tragic, isn't it? I hardly flinched. I suppose I was getting used to strange Norse entities popping up in my personal space. Standing next to me, gazing at the monument, was a woman with elven pale skin and long dark hair. In profile, she looked heart-achingly beautiful, about 25 years old. Her ermine cloak shimmered like a snowdrift t- rippling in the wind. Then she turned towards me, and my lungs flattened against the back of my ribcage. The right side of the woman's face was a nightmare. Withered skin, patches of blue ice covering decayed flesh, membrane thin lips over rotten teeth, a milky white eye, and tufts of desiccated hair like black spider webs. And uh, Magnus being Magnus, I love he thinks, okay, this isn't too bad. She's just like Two-Face from Batman. <laughs> yeah, sounds about right. Mm-hmm. And it's not just her face. Her entire right side of her body is like that. She's described yeah. as having a skeletal hand. Basically, uh, she summoned him essentially to offer a trade. Not a trade, a reunion. Mm-hmm. She reveals that, or she claims to have the soul of Magnus's mom. Yeah, of course. Okay, so she doesn't spaceship say, she's like, she implies, you know, I could arrange a reunion. And he asks, like, my mother, you have her. I could have her. The status of her soul, of everything she was, is still in flux. And she says, I cannot return Natalie Chase to life, but I can reunite you both in Helheim if you wish it. I can bind your souls there so you will never be separated. You will be a family again. What's the logistics of that? What does that mean? Right, unclear. She says, right, because she doesn't, I could have her. Does that mean you do or you don't or her soul's nowhere or you could bring her into Helheim? It sounds like she could get her, but she doesn't really like have her because maybe that's not how like souls work. Yeah. If it's not in in Harry or the uh, Vanaheim group. Yeah, uh, it is. Quietly unclear about what 
Okay, I found out what she wants. Take the sword to your uncle, Hell urged. Let events unfold without you. This is a safer course. If you do so, my father, Loki, has asked me to reward you. <laughs> so, yeah, give the sword to Roger, Rupert, Randolph. R- Randolph. 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 And just don't do anything. And I'll let you be with your mom again. Mm, no. Yeah. That's basically Magnus. He decides. Well, he thinks about it. He's like, oh, yeah, in hell where it's icy and cold and dark. Yeah, no, my mom would hate that. That'd be an awful, dude. That'd be what an the fuck? awful. So, no, I won't. I won't agree to that. Because he's like, it, it, it's wherever her soul is at. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's in flux. What it's does that in, mean? Yeah, what does that mean for uh, it's, I mean, I reckon. I haven't done the research for this episode. Know why it's ro- why Ryarden wrote it the way he wrote it in this passage. <laughs> and we'll get to that here. But it is like, hey, Hal, I don't really think you have a bargaining chip here. No. Un- unlike Hades, who's like, here's your mom in my hand. I literally have her. I stole her right before she died. Yeah. You don't have anything except, well, I could bring your mom to this icy hellscape. Literal icy hellscape. Yeah. And you would be there with her. And Magnus is like, my mom would hate that. I want to see my mom again. I absolutely miss her so much. But I'm not going to say yes to that deal because she'd be so upset. Whatever afterlife she's in. The old in, Viking term for impossible was when hell melts. When hell melts. <laughs> anyway. So <laughs> it doesn't quite have the same ring no, as when hell freezes. When hell doesn't. thaws out, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I like that. Yeah, but that's also like Ragnarok, probably. <laughs> that's true. Everything when hell thaws out is Ragnarok. Yep. End of all things. And basically, Magnus says, uh, no. Hard pass. I uh, don't Sounds have a awful. deal, sharks. He's like, okay, bye. Yep. Sends him off. Cool. <laughs> and that's not, oh, well, then we see her again in Nine from the Nine Worlds. Yeah. Where she goes to TJ and is like, hey, my dog got loose and you're going to go get him back. You're going to do it because I have your mom right in because front of you. Because I and actually have your such mom. such a harder fucking image. Yeah. <laughs> of his mother, terrified, but like angry at them. Yeah. We also, it's unclear, like, what is she seeing? Does he, because she TJ sees, for a bit. she doesn't see TJ. She doesn't even know. And she promises. She's uh, hell just looking over talking to, to her something. Son. <laughs> she knows, like, who are you talking to? But she doesn't see TJ. And yeah. So it is, it's, it's like. Riordan was kind of doing a redo for yeah. Just felt this like fucking. What do I do with a hell here? <laughs> yeah, um, and answers nothing because she doesn't appear again. We have three more books and she does like, not I just show up. Not again. gonna deal with like it's. She's probably got. I mean, from what I know of Norse, she's there's probably nothing on her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like. Playing with this is hard. <laughs> Doing a character is difficult. <laughs> we don't need... Which, to be fair, it's not like she was missing from any of the other interactions. No. Like, later on, when... In Ship of the Dead, when Magnus hears Randolph and his wife and his cousins, and does he hear his mother's voice? I don't know. I think he might. It's like they're... Aren't cl- they telling him to open his eyes, though? They're trying to lure them into, because they're invisible. Yeah. So they're sneaking through to get onto the ship, and they are trying to lure them into hell, where they're at. And so you have the voices of the the dead calling out to them. And we don't hear who Alex hears, but Alex says it's a friend of theirs who who died. But Samira doesn't hear anyone. She doesn't (laughs) have... Which I is, got nobody that I care about that died yet. <laughs> but which isn't true because her mom has passed away. But did she really know her mom that well? Do we know that? See, that's what's tricky is that... From what from what I was aware, mom died at like two, maybe one, but like s- young. Yeah, we don't... That That's actually interesting. I don't know... And she know. was raised by her grandma and grandpa. Yeah, so I don't know... We don't really know exactly when Samira's mom passed away. Yeah. But still, like, it does mean she still has someone, but Samira is Muslim. And she has a very specific afterlife belief true. system. Very she true. would not believe that her mother was in a Norse afterlife. She would believe her mother is somewhere her mother else. Pro- also, given this world and how its own like rules, right? Because we know it's Percy Jackson. Most likely, her mother just actually didn't go to any other afterlife aside from the Muslim afterlife. Yeah, whatever whatever is the, yeah. the belief plan, like, Samira wouldn't... And I think that's partially it. Like, Samira doesn't have anyone who she was maybe, like close to 
in the her mom died when she was super young. We don't even know if she has memories of her mom. Like yeah. she doesn't talk. We don't. That's a shocking oversight. What is the, why? That? Why do we need to talk about her mom? Because she's one of the main characters, and We're not, not in her head though. That's true, but we know Annabeth's deal. Yeah, but we were also in Annabeth's head. But like way later. But it's also like Annabeth, both her parents are still alive. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to like compare. Some Annabeth like, wasn't like adopted usually... by somebody. <laughs> or like Talia, we know her, we know Talia found out her mother passed away in a car accident. So it's like. Yeah, but we were also in Jason's head. No, but we found that out in Titan's Curse. <laughs> Did we? Yes. She and Percy have a conversation about it. And Man. Percy's like, oh, is that why you were maybe, to drive? Maybe she was uh, weak from being a tree for four years. <laughs> Mostly, it, it is just, it's just me realizing that I, if it's said anywhere, it was in something passing. that I, in passing, glossed over that I cannot. I, I think it's only that like mm-hmm. her mom died young and she was taken. She's raised by her, by her grandparents. grandparents, yeah. So, But yeah, I like that. But I think it works both ways where it's like Samira doesn't have anyone who would be calling out to her like that. Yeah. And she also, the one person she does have who she loved who is gone, she would not believe was yeah. there. And that's so interesting. Because also, we're, you got to wonder why. I think I need to go get the book and confirm whether or not Magnus hears his mom. Okay. Okay, got it. All right, DJ. In the Hammer of Thor, no voice has happened. He just falls down. Looks like. I feel like I remember them saying that somehow. Maybe, maybe it was this book, and I'm thinking of just the, both the same fucking cliff. <laughs> so it is. So I've got the. It's towards the end of Ship of the Dead. They're walking across Invisible Sam, Alex, and Magnus, and they're following the army of like. There's an army of the dead that has come out of like a cavern in the earth that are heading towards the ship. Yeah. I stepped into the tracks left by the dead army, and immediately whispering voices filled my head. Magnus. Magnus. Pain spiked my eyes. My knees buckled. I knew these voices. Some are harsh and angry, others kind and gentle. All of them echoed in my mind, demanding attention. One of them. One of them was my mother's. I staggered. Then we hear Uncle Randolph calling to him. We hear Caroline, the cousins. And then most painful of all, most painful of all, my mom called. Come on, Magnus. In the cheerful tone she used to use when she was encouraging me to hurry up the trail so she could share an amazing vista with me. Except now there was a coldness in her voice, as if her lungs filled with freon. Hurry! The voices tore at me, taking pieces of my mind. Was I 16? Was I 12 or 10? Was I in Niflheim or in Blue Hills or on Uncle Randolph's boat? Alex's hand dropped from mine. I didn't care. I stepped towards the cave. And then eventually, Sam finds Alex. Alex grabs Magnus. They all step out of it. And there's this, like, Magnus. Back and forth. Well, a little bit like them, but, like, we can't follow them. We have to go. Part of me was still resisting the urge to run across the snow, fling myself down, and claw at the ground until the tunnel reopened. Oh, because the tunnel closed. That mm-hmm. helped with mm-hmm. the... I'd heard my mother, even if it was just a cold echo or a trick, a cruel joke from hell. Yeah, I I feel like it would be a trick. That's the thing, right? Is that now we're lost? With, like, was it a trick? Or... I feel like it was a trick to divert Magnus away from his mission. Because mm-hmm. Alex hears it too. She <laughs> hears her grandfather, and then he, she hears her friend Adrian. And we don't hear what she hears, but we hear her response to them at one point in time. She says, "No, no, I won't. I'm not. I won't." Yeah. Clearly, being like, "I'm not going to follow you into death," basically. Yeah. Because it, it is that thing. It's like clearly they're all like, "Oh, Magnus, please forgive your family. Come with us. Come join us. Don't you want to like?" And you have to assume that's not what. Magnus's family would do. I mean, Uncle Randolph of it aside, like surely not what his. I don't think would Uncle do. and Randolph would do it at the end there. No, probably not. Yeah. So, it is the the question of it's probably a trick. It's most likely a trick. Mm-hmm. Just, Just using to... using the voices of these people he mm-hmm. loved and respected. Yeah, because you also have Loki keeps tormenting Randolph by claiming he has his family's souls. Yeah. And that's another thing where it's like, well, if Hal's over here saying that she could maybe get Natalie Chase's soul, there's also no evidence that Loki actually has them as well. Yeah. It's just... Or has no way to get them mm-hmm. either. So those are, and then there's the nine from the nine where TJ actually goes to hell to get Garum the dog. And I just realized I was picturing it as like a very bleak, dark, gray, lifeless 
not like sandy desert, but like grasslands, sagebrush desert. Yeah. And I don't know whether it was described that way or that's just the image my brain supplied or if there were any strong descriptions at all. But it just kind of felt like a barren battlefield in my head. Uh, where the Ship of the Dead is or? or uh, in, in, in Nine from the Night. Oh, yeah. Black and Rocky. Black and Rocky, yeah. Like uh, where uh, Loki dies in Dark World? Yeah. Dies. Oh, yeah. Right. That, that kind of area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it definitely feels like TJ's encounter with hell is a redo of Magnus's encounter with hell, but like with the stakes realized. Yeah, it definitely is like, uh, <laughs> and it's something that he can like willingly do without actually endangering the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, yeah, sure, I'll go get your dog back, yeah, so maybe dude, I can... who cares? It fucking doesn't matter to me, jeez. <laughs> he's like, yeah, you can't torture me. And she's like, okay, well, I can threaten your mom. Yeah. And it's like, well, that sucks. Okay, I guess I'll get your dog back, and maybe you'll let me see my mom, but I don't know. I don't care. Whatever. Get out of my house. Yeah, very good. Big fan of TJ. Oh, I love TJ. I'm a big fan of TJ. He's great. But yeah, it's the the overall, like, it. I didn't realize until just now this conversation, where it's like, oh, yeah, those the first scene and this latest scene are like, the same, except it actually works different. this time. It's wildly different, except because now she actually was like, oh, no, but she's like, I learned for the last time. I do actually have to have their mother in order yeah. for this it, to work. This will be a stronger image. Good over you. Yeah, I do have your mom. <laughs> Look at that. So those are the, I know I just have all three of the Magnus Chase books on my bed. Those are all the uh, evidence of hell and Helheim mm -hmm. that we see throughout the books. Yep. And now... In the myths, DJ, how many times do you think hell is actually mentioned in the Eddas? Once. You know what? No. Oh. Shockingly, <laughs> where are the Eddas? Once when describing hell and once when describing a single action. So twice. Shockingly, uh, compared to other times, there is actually a little bit more of hell, but maybe not the one you're thinking. Okay. So in this episode, we're going to cover... Hell, the yep. place, hell, the entity, yep. and Garm, the dog. Yes. Garm is, I'm just going to mention that real quick, Hound of Hell mentioned once by name as being a thing that resides in hell once uh, when Odin goes to hell. We'll get to that later. There is a stanza that mentions a whelp that kept barking at him. That is assumed to be Garm, but not named uh, specifically. Yeah, I'm sure this dog would look like a whelp to uh, Odin. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was like, well, I thought... I don't, I'm like, maybe I don't know what whelp means. Like, hold on. Well, I would, like, whelp means like a smaller or maybe like golden retriever sized dog. Maybe. And then the last interesting tidbit I have about. I guess in terms of like, if you're used to like wolves. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Golden retriever is probably like yeah. a whelp. Mm -hmm. Last. Oh, uh, the beast of hell will cure, will kill Tyrn, one of the gods in uh, Ragnarok. And then once upon a time, scholars are actually pretty certain that this hellhound figure was probably one and the same as Fenris, mm. and then likely split over time. Nice. Okay, I'm done with the dog now. Let's talk about hell. Okay. So, DJ, where's hell? Hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was the answer. That's not the answer. Um, Helheim. Helheim. Mm, no, we want to, want to... Well, well, well. It's under one of the three roots of Yidrasil. Yes, I know what I said in the last episode about all the things. We're just going to... Everything I've said... Or in... Greenland. Or Greenland. Why Greenland, DJ? It's every picture I see of it, and like the more snowy areas, black and rocky, snowy, you know. Yeah, yeah, okay. Not bad, <laughs> not bad. Uh, yes, I know what I said in the Yedrasil episode about not actually being specific with Nine Realms. And that everything I said in the Yedrasil episode is going to stay in the Yedrasil episode because we cannot overcomplicate the other episodes going forward. Norse mythology is crazy, guys. Yes. In the episodes going forward, we are going to take the context and the translations we have at their face value yep. in this specific context. So what is written, what we have, what is translated, we're just going to... That's what I'm going to focus on in each episode and not try to layer in. But also, if we believe this, but also what the, the, yeah, yeah. that's just feels like it will overburden and convolute the episodes too much and then make them somewhat difficult for someone who's just jumping in on the latest episode. I, I don't I don't want to design our show in such a way where you literally do need to listen to every episode in order to understand. It's not that kind of series. Yeah, I think so. I know what I said. This is what I'm saying now. In 
the poem, Grimir's sayings, we do get a description of uh, the, the descriptions of Yggdrasil specifically, but we have a stanza that says, Three roots grow in three directions under Yggdrasil's ash. Hell lives under one, under the second, the frost giants, under the third, humankind. Okay. So it suggests Hell, Jotunheim, and Midgard are all underneath the roots of the world tree. Interesting. Yeah. Didn't expect Midgard to be there. Yeah, me neither. But that's apparently where it's supposed to be. All right. Uh, in the Sybil's Prophecy, we get a mention of Hell specifically as it relates to the oncoming of Ragnarok. This one being the talk of the the roosters. The golden combed crow near the Aesir, he awakens the warriors at Father's host hall, another crow below the earth, a sooty red cock in the halls of hell. And this is actually where we mention Garm, who bays loudly before the Gibna cave. A fetter will break and the ravener runs free. Much of my wisdom she knows I see further ahead. The mighty doom of the gods of the victory gods. Huh. Nice. Yeah. And that one is specifically like, it, it, it kind of underlines those two stands together. I, I mentioned those two poems in that order because it demonstrates the concept of hell as a physical location, mm -hmm. not a abstract concept of, of afterlife and death. But this is a place that exists in a sense that it is in re like physical relation to Midgard, where the humans live. And Jotunheim. Then the fact that the next important thing you need to know, or technically the first important thing you need to know about it, since the Seer's Prophecy is the poem that comes first, is that Ragnarok will start once things start to pop off in Hell. Okay. Hell is mentioned other times throughout the Poetic Eddas as specifically, well, as, as, as a place where the dead go. There is a poem called the first poem of Gundrun, and it is a, this woman is speaking and she has just had to prepare the burial mounds of her family. And she says, I myself had to handle their journey to hell. Specifically citing the concept of like, what is hell? It's a place. Ragnarok will start here. It is also where the dead go. Yeah. And that is a concept that is dug in a little deeper in a poem, Brunhild's Ride to Hell. And a little bit of context on this poem. It's wild. Yeah. The Well, the poem itself is pretty straightforward. You have this figure. She is going to hell. On the way, she encounters a giantess who insults her, and they get into a back and forth. But you need a little bit more context as to who this figure is to understand why any of this is happening. And so this is not a Brunhild episode, um, and I'll probably dig into it a little bit more when we get to the Valkyries episode proper. But Brunhild is sometimes, not always, sometimes a Valkyrie who, for whatever reason, was put into a sleep by Odin and then where she was resting was surrounded by a ring of fire and only a man who showed no fear would be able to marry her by crossing into the fire and waking her up. And so you have this dude named... <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just expecting <laughs> Shrek rolling up as... Hey, wake up, yeah, shaking hey. her away. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this hero, Sigurd, comes through. He disguises himself as his brother, Gunnar, rescues Brunhild, but she thinks it's the brother that did this because Sigurd is already married, but Gunnar isn't. So she marries the brother, thinking he's the one yeah. who had no fear and rescued her. And later on, when she finds out, she... Kills the coward? convinces her husband to kill his brother. Whoa. And then sometimes after that has happened, she then takes her own life. That's crazy. Yes. So that's why I'm like, let me give you some context to what's going on here. Because it actually it circles back to some points that we're going to talk about hell. But that's the deal with there. And that's like, uh, and sometimes other things happen that result in these two figures' deaths later not about this episode this <laughs> we will is talk the... about it later possibly so this poem specifically opens with her corpse being burned on the pyre mm. which is what they do with that yeah, yeah. that's how you handle the deceased so she's going she's arguing about her life the decisions she made this is who i am this is why i did what i did she uh, essentially is like accused of in the poem that we have it's it's clearly supposed to be a continuation of another version of the poem. And in that one, 
someone accused her of sleeping with Sigrun, which she's like, I did not do. I never did that. I am traveling to hell. So men and women, those who are living, must spend all too long in terrible sorrow. But we shall live fully all of our time together, Sugun and I. Now, Ogres, sink. <laughs> okay. So what we get from that? That sounds like uh, there. she was actually was in love with Sigrun. Mm-hmm. And the only way that she could be with him was by convincing the brother to kill him mm-hmm. and uh, to kill herself. Right? Yeah. It's... Like, I didn't sleep with him in life, but I'm gonna end up. Yeah, so what, <laughs> but the reason I bring this up for this specific one is that this poem proposes that one, the dead travel to their final destination. And this poem is the title of it is Brunhud's Ride to Hell. Yeah. And so, whether, while she never in any of the stanzas specifically says, I am going to hell, that is. Uh, That's oh, what's no. implied here. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> I'm wrong. It's right here, actually. Uh, yeah. She's like, yeah, she says she sent men off to hell, but that is where she's going. And then she believes, and that is believed that Sigrun will be there as well, and they will be reunited. So we can, from those cons- from those statements, interpret some beliefs that the people who told these stories would have had about hell. It's just where you go when you die. I, I wonder what it says about the difference. I mean, there's obviously a difference between Viking and Greece, right? Uh-huh. Or Nordic and uh, Greece mythology. Mm-hmm. The difference between them walking to Hel- Helheim on their own mm-hmm. and with uh, in Greek mythology, Thanatos shows up or Hermes shows up to guide them to the underworld. I, Yeah, that's... Yeah, let's talk about that. I like that. It, it, it does imply a stronger sense of autonomy. Right, that in death, in in these like ancient Greek belief systems, you are spirited away to this next place. You have no choice. Yeah, like a god will show up, and this is your next. The gods are still literally controlling your world. Yeah, wherein in in this Nordic beliefs, there is perhaps you can interpret it as this sense of duty. You are now dead. And the dead go to hell. So you are going to get yourself to that next destination. Yeah. And the only ones who have anyone guiding them, it seems like we could talk about the Valkyries who guide the warriors to Valhalla. Yeah. And that one feels like, but that's an extra special tier. Not everyone gets to go there. Yeah, because if you take the standard path in the afterlife, you're just going to end up in yeah. Helheim. Mm-hmm. So it's like that... You're right. The only ones who get guides are the ones who go somewhere special that they couldn't just get to on their own. Yeah. Whereas for everyone else, at least for we're still talking about this conversation, when you die, you go to hell. And you will, the fact that Brunhild walks there herself or that even other figures like the, the previous one, Gunnarun describes it as preparing her family for their journey to hell. Like it's a, it's still an arduous experience. You don't just die and wake up there. You still have to get your ass to hell Perhaps because, as we mentioned earlier, it's a physical place. Yeah. There, it's literally... They describe it. It's next, it's right, there's a hell, and there's where the giants live, and there's where humans live. It's yep. under the three roots of Yedrasil, which means you have to They're go They're close there. by, actually. They're very mm-hmm. close. Yeah. So that's, that's a good clock of, like, you could extrapolate a lot or do a lot of digging based on how, when souls die, why does one belief system have gods ferrying like them. relatively close and the ferrymen will ferry him across the river like yeah. there is deities like they bring him to the yeah the river and there is transportation whereas for the these like norse beliefs you die and you got you got to do the burial rites though right we're still doing that that's important oh, yeah. but after that point you got to get yourself to to your final destination and i think for me i think that wouldn't imply a lot more autonomy and sense of duty. It's a little bit like the Egyptian one where when you die, the Book of the Dead is all these texts on like all the spells and instructions you'll need to get through the obstacles to get to. Yeah. Like your journey's not over. You have to keep going. Yeah. <clears throat> so Odin also took a trip to hell. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Of course he did. He went all over the place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, this is true. Uh, specifically, uh, I guess I did say we were going to... One more thing before we pivot out of the poetic Edda. But that's 
not necessarily true. Because while this is part of the Poetic Edda, what I, something I said episodes ago is what the Poetic Edda is the Codex Regis, that collection of poems that mm-hmm. were found in uh, Denmark. Yeah. This particular piece is called, translated as Baldur's Dreams. And it was not part of the Poetic, uh, the, the, the Codex Regis. It is part of a manuscript, AM748I4TO, commonly known as Manuscript A. Okay. Now, I did try to figure out why it's called that, that naming. <laughs> I don't, it's clearly just some sort of scholarly classification. Yeah. But I could not figure out what, why, how. Like, why I don't know. Why is it just another why... edit, bro? Yeah, I don't know why it's called that specifically. But this manuscript A dates around to dates to around 1300, and it's only six sheets of this surviving manuscript. And five of them are edic poems. Uh-huh. So the poems you find in the Codex Regis. But one of them is not. And this one is called The Baldur's Dream. And it's actually, we have it complete. Like, it just so happens that of these six pages of these, like, the five of the six poems, one of them is the complete text of this poem that exists nowhere else. Nice. That's sweet. Mm Mm-hmm. And in this poem, uh, it is about specifically Baldur has been having dreams that he's going to die, and Odin's like, that's weird. So he goes to hell and resurrects a seer from (laughs) hell and asks her a bunch of questions. And this is where we mentioned the 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 dog, the whelp that barks at yeah. Odin. And it's uh, Odin's described as he literally goes on a journey and he rode to Mist Hell. There he met a whelp coming from hell. Bloody it was on the front of its chest, and long it barked at the father of magic. On road Odin, the earth road resounded as he approached the high hall of hell. Then Odin rode east of the doors, where he knew the Cirrus's grave to be. He began to speak a corpse-reviving spell for the magic-wise woman, until, reluctantly, she rose and spoke these corpse wards. The rest of the poem is a conversation where he is trying... And we talked about this in regards to Ragnarok of Odin getting this information about what's going to happen to Baldur. Why is my son having dreams about him dying? Yeah. But you may have noticed all the things I just mentioned in these poems are of hell as a place, not a person. No. I have one example in these poems of a person being defined as as hell, as death. And that is in the poem that's translated as the Lay of Hymir. And death as a concept is paraphrased. It's like the poetic construct of joy. Oh, I'm just going to find that actually because this is the note I have is not fucking doesn't make any goddamn sense out of context. Okay. So this poem is essentially about two brothers who are getting revenge for the death of their sister. So one of the stanzas read, They pulled from their sheaths the sheathed iron, the edges of the sword, to the joy of the troll woman. They diminished their might by a third. They made a young lad sink to the ground. So essentially a poetic way of saying they killed this dude. Mm -hmm. And that concept of to the joy of the troll woman. And that could be a poetic description of hell. I've never ever heard of it described as a troll or it could be a reference to the concept of a uh, adis which is a female figure from from norse mythology uh, a deity or like a spirit some sort okay. of like ma- not necessarily malevolent but in this context would be viewed as such just some benevolent or malevolent Malevolent, not necessarily, but sometimes, but essentially just some sort of death spirit, not necessarily hell as this goddess concept. Yeah. So, DJ, if I just mentioned all the places where we have hell specifically mentioned in the Poetic Edda, do you want to guess who who we have the concept of hell as a goddess comes from? Is it Snorri? It's Snorri! Of course it's Snorri, let's go. Where's he at? Here's, I got it. Got him. So. A you... single fucking tag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Compared to the Poetic Edda, which had like six or seven, mm-hmm. this one's got only one. Yeah. And actually, it's the um one about uh, Niflheim. <laughs> <laughs> Just forgot to take it out. Well, it is. This, so, so Niflheim. So, right. Okay. So here we have most of the concepts of 
hell as a place and hell as a deity that Snorri presents us comes from the Gilfaningening. Okay. Which is that king who's talking with the three high, just as high, and the third. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, who was probably just Odin sharing all this knowledge with the king. And so we have a conversation about who the greatest god is. And it's Odin. He made the heaven, earth, and skies and everything in them. Then third said, most important, he created man and gave him a living spirit that will never die, even if the body rots to dust or burns to ashes. All men who are righteous shall live and be with him in that place called Gimli or Vingolf. But evil men go to hell and from there into Niflhel, parentheses, dark hell, which is below in the ninth world. Nice. According to Snorri, evil dudes are the ones who are going to go to hell. But not just evil dudes. Not Every, everyone. Everyone, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so this is the first mention of hell we have in the Gilfaninginning. Pin yeah. in that. That's the first mention. Con- the concept of Niflheim, dark world. The idea that it, it, it came at the same time as... Well, technically, Muspelheim comes first. And that's the realm of fire. And then Niflheim, which you know translates to dark world. And it's not specifically defined the detail. Like Niflheim is literally that region flames and burns and is impassable to foreigners. Thor Niflheim. <laughs> what? Thor Niflheim. Why do you keep saying that? Thor Dark World. Oh. Um, <laughs> you just said it with your own mouth. Right, but I wasn't thinking of it in that context. So the idea of Niflheim and if Niflheim is where hell is. The, the idea of it being icy and cold and thus hell being icy and cold mm-hmm. kind of comes from an extension of it supposedly being a mirror to Muspelheim. If Muspelheim is fire and it was the first thing it created, then the next thing must have been ice. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And that's just an extrapolation. This is the only source that connects hell to Niflheim. Mm-hmm. In the uh, other poem, it just says hell is a realm of its own and not connected to also Niflheim. Yeah. But Snorri plays his own rules. Snorri uh, just wanted to write in the style. Snorri just wanted to write. He just wanted to teach you how to write poems yep. in the Icelandic tradition. The next time. So that's the first time we have hell mentioned by Snorri, right? Yeah. It's a place specifically where evil men go, right? If they are not righteous, they righteous men go live with Odin in death. Evil men in, get sent to hell. Yeah. What a specific thought. But later, we get the chapter, the... Oh, because because uh, the Gilfandingening, I don't know if I mentioned it. It's broken up into chapters. Okay. And this chapter, chapter thirty four, is called Loki's monstrous children, and this is where we get the mention of Hell as a deity. Uh huh. Or I, I guess maybe just a monster. But Loki had other children with Angaboda, Sorrowbringer, an ogress who lived in Giant Land. Loki had three children. One was the Fenris wolf, the second was the Midgard serpent, and the third was Hell. And when the uh, Aesir discovered that these children were being brought up in giant land, they were like, that's probably no good because their mom's not great, their dad's shady as fuck, and we've got prophecies to tell us they're (laughs) going to be a big hashtag problem. Yeah. So the gods are sent, they take the children, they keep calling them the children, so it's unclear about whether or not they are children at this time or if they are grown up. And are just, you know, the still children of Loki. But they grab the children and bring them to him. When they appeared before him, he threw the serpent into the deep sea. Hell he threw down into Niflheim and made her ruler over nine worlds. She has the power to dole out lodgings and provisions to those who are sent to her. And they are people who have died of disease or old age. She has there an enormous dwelling with the walls of immense height and huge gates. Her hall is called Edunir, sprayed with snowstorms. Her dish is hunger, her knife is famine, her slave is lazy, and slothful is her woman servant. Then I side note, I find it interesting that sometimes the translator will do the like Seven deadly? the the ner- well no the, like the translation will be like the 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 word like Elden here uh-huh. and then just say this is the definition. But then when they do like her knife, her her dish, her slave, her they'll just do the translated term because they have words specific terms it's probably when like one word can translate into like multiple words Mm, yeah right right. sprayed with snowstorms the threshold over which people enter is a pitfall called fall and afford falling to peril her bed is named core sick bed 
and her bed curtains are named Bilk Janadabol, Gleaming Disaster. She is half black and half a lighter <laughs> flesh color and is easily recognized. Mostly, she is gloomy and cruel. Sounds like hell. Yeah, sounds like hell because it's literally the one description we have. Of her. <laughs> it's literally, hey, where do we get the concept of hell that we build off of and cite as Norse mythology? Right there. That's what I just read to you, D. Thank you, Snorri. Thank you, Snorri. You left us with a lot. So here's a fun fact. Do you remember when I said that the first time they mention hell, they say it's a place where the wicked go? Yeah. And this next time I just said uh, that those who are sent to hell are people who have died of disease or old age. Wicked. Yeah. They're evil. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> They're uh, foul beings, yeah. those they got sick grandmas and became, grandpa. <laughs> they are sick or geriatric. Now, do you remember earlier when in that Brunhild's Ride to Hell poem, we have Sigurd, who was died after his brother killed him, and uh, Brunhild, who uh, took her own life, yeah. and they both went to hell? Yeah, it's because hell wasn't supposed to be for the bad people. Yeah. That's a Snorri thing, because Snorri was Christian. Hey, DJ, you got it! Let me oh, yeah. read to you! It was, it's called hell, so he's like, yeah, that's, that's our hell, right? <laughs> Let me read to you! Some thoughts from the English folklorist Hilda Ellis Davidson. It seems likely that Snorri's account of the underworld is chiefly his own work. It is possible that there is another Snorse. Snorse. <laughs> it's possible that there's another source that Snorri was using that, that was the foundation of his uh, interpretation of this concept of hell. Yeah. But it's also entirely possible that Snorri built his depiction of hell entirely based on the Christian teachings about the afterlife. The idea that there's two places, good people go with God, bad people go into the the hell, the underworld. Yeah. And that connection. So something I didn't mention at the top, and perhaps should have, and actually definitely should have, is the etymology behind the word hell. Mm -hmm. Did you want to take a crack, a wild guess? What do you think it, it means when you just completely break it down to kind of the earliest interpretation? Bad. It is from a Proto-Germanic word meaning concealed place, mm. the underworld. And if it's, it makes sense if it is literally supposed to be under one of the roots of Yggdrasil. Yeah. So you've got Snorri who is out here doing some writing and you've got this term for hell. That we, when I say hell, like, you know I'm talking about Norse mythology, but there's probably for you, DJ, me, and dear listeners, a little inkling in your head that keeps having to remind yourself that it is about Norse mythology and not about this Christian concept of where sinners go when they die. Yeah. Because of translations. Would you be so surprised? I don't know. I was going to save this for later, but I think it's worthwhile talking about now, especially because it's like, why would the underworld, why would Snorri very specifically be like, well, it's hell. Like you just said, DJ. Yeah, it's hell. We have a hell. We have a hell because English is a Germanic language. Yes. And so many, most Germanic languages, that word hell has a counterpart that is roughly the same and means the same place, this underworld place. How do I want to wear this? The Bible that we have was written in Greek. Nice. So you have the word that the writers were using to describe this place where the the dead went, where the, the wicked the would be sent as Hades, mm -hmm. which is very specifically... An underworld. So when you have English translations roll or translators roll up and be like, okay, well, what word are we going to use for this idea? Well, the underworld. The underworld. Because also in, in the <laughs> Bible, um, specifically when we're going to focus on the New Testament, there is not a depiction of the underworld. There's sometimes, there's a parable where Jesus describes that those who do not care for their like least fortunate brothers, right, will be cast into river, lakes of fire. Yeah. And from that is extrapolated a lot about how most of those ideas we have about how this is not a concept Dante's Inferno. Dante's Inferno is a lot of a lot of where a we lot get of our what, iconography. A lot of what Snorri did to Norse myth for Norse mythology, Dante's Inferno does for Christian iconography. Yeah. So you have 
Hades just being translated as hell because it is a word that means underground, concealed. It is associated with death already. It is a place where the dead go. So that's the word we used. And it has come to have a very specific meaning, especially like in, in Hebrew versions of the Bible, they have the word shiloh, shalom. And that one is usually mostly translated as grave. And, and they perhaps don't necessarily mean place of punishment. And there are specific terms like Gehenna or Tartarus that are specifically about where these the wicked are punished in the afterlife. Yeah. So is it totally incorrect to say that the underworld of Greek mythology is hell when the word comes from a meaning that means a concealed underground place? I don't see why not. Yeah. Uh, it does just now that we have a thousand years of specific connotations about the idea of hell. Perhaps not totally accurate because it implies certain things about the Greek afterlife that don't exist. Oh, yeah. The Greek afterlife mm -hmm. is, if you actually look at it. As can, we did for you, many years. Yeah, you could maybe argue Tartarus. Maybe. There is a river fire. We do know that. Mm -hmm. But the fields of Asphodel aren't anything like what Dante's Inferno is. Yeah. No, exactly. And it is largely the idea that the Greek Hades is something evil and where the damned go and things like that is largely because the Bible translated Hades as hell and we became to associate certain things about hell and that kind of almost backwashed back into the idea. Yep. So, yeah. What Here, happens when we become the prominent religion of a whole, con of a whole uh, 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 continent? Yeah. And then the majority of the world. And then just a, bi a big... Not the majority anymore. A big chunk of the world. Big chunk. Big old pretty chunk of the world, actually. Now, I mentioned earlier how the chap the, the, the Gilfeningening is divided into chapters. 34 is Loki's monstrous children. Yeah. 35 is called goddesses. Okay. And every goddess, is, or, t you know, tons of goddesses are listed among that. Nice. Hell is not. All right. So she's a beast. Yes. She's essentially, by Snorri, been equated to Fenris Wolf and Jormungandr. And specifically, not a goddess, mm -hmm. though she is a ruler of hell. And the only other time that you encounter her specifically is, again, later on in the Gilfeningening, where Herndor goes to hell to rescue Balder. You know, that god that everyone likes. Yeah. That was killed by accident by his brother in a mistletoe incident. By accident. Well, yes, it wasn't. He he wasn't trying to kill his brother. They were just throwing shit at him because it was fun. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, I guess. But we'll, we'll, it was it, it wasn't an accident to Loki, right? It was the brother did it on accident. The brother Loki didn't did it on know. Purpose. <laughs> the brother didn't know that this was a plan. Yeah, that this was yeah. He's like, oh, I'll just throw this. That'll be fun. But so for so this other dude goes down and is like, one specifically goes to hell, passes the road. There's like a whole bridge. There's someone who guards the bridge. It's a whole thing. And speaks to Hell, who gives him the terms and conditions to allow Balder to return to the land of the living. And we're just going to put a pin in that for now. But we will just circle back and acknowledge that uh, Balder definitely didn't die of sickness or old age. No. And was definitely not wicked, who because he was considered one of the very, very best of the, the, yeah. the gods, and his death was a total tragedy. And yet, and the thing is, like, it's so very well known that he ends up in hell. So it, it does lend a lot of the, these discrepancies with what figures in the poems end up in hell demonstrate that it is very likely that Snorri was very, very heavily influenced by his Christian beliefs in describing hell. Yeah. Also was perhaps very, very interest, uh, influenced by poetry. Of course. It's a poet. Because, because he's a poet. Because more often than not, when hell is mentioned, it's being used as a literary device. You'll have Balder being referred to as Hell's Companion. 
Loki is called Hel's father. Given to Hel simply means someone has died, or death, close sister of Odin's enemy. It becomes another question of whether or not the f- people who practice these Norse mythology, these beliefs as a living tradition, actually had a goddess of hell. Mm-hmm. Because honestly, she doesn't show up until really crazy late. <laughs> and that's true for a lot of what we have written down, but uh, to reference Davidson again, she notes that hell kind of just used to signify death or the grave. And that personification of any concept is something that naturally occurs to, in poems to poets across any language. Yeah. So the idea that death itself becomes this entity is not so uncommon. And it is perhaps that literary device that eventually led to death becoming a goddess. Mm-hmm. Davidson herself actually does not believe there's any surviving evidence to suggest that death is, in fact, a goddess. The evidence we have being the poetic Eddas, wherein hell as a goddess, as a deity... Doesn't show up. Doesn't show it's up. It's just and, they're talking about, like, oh, it's it's death, it's yeah, hell, it's... you go to hell. Odin himself, when he goes to hell to ask questions, he does not speak to hell. He speaks to a prophetess who is in hell, who has yeah. already died. Essentially, Davidson says that Snorri may have earlier turned the goddess of death into an allegorical figure, just as he made hell, the underworld of shades, a place where wicked men go, like the Christian hell. Mm -hmm. So it's Snorri flexing a lot. And this is not a belief that she has alone, like scholars John Lindau and Rudolf Simek have also come to argue the same conclusion as Davidson with uh, Simek. It's like, dude, we appreciate what Snorri did for us. It's awesome. A little bias here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? We had a lot of creative liberties. Simek said that hell is probably a very late personification of the underworld and that there aren't any, like the first scriptures of the goddess of hell are found at the end of the 10th and in the 11th centuries. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, year 1000 when Iceland was like, okay, we're, we're going to do, we're going to do Christianity official now, which is so very long after this was a practice belief. And Lindo notes that The translation says that people are in rather than with hell. We are clearly dealing with a place rather than a person. And this is assumed to be the much older conception. It is like he theorizes that like hell was a noun and that it simply meant grave and the personification came later. Nice. Yeah. That is, once again, (laughs) a lot of what we have here is one guy who really likes Icelandic poetry not necessarily, because again, it may not be Snorri just made this up whole cloth. It could be at that point in time, it was a practice belief of like, yes, and in hell there was the the king, the ruler of hell as goddess figure herself. Yeah. But that, again, is where we stand on this precipice of what was... What did you have that we didn't, Snorri? What did you have that we didn't, Snorri? Exactly. Was there another poem? Was it just poets of the time had done this? Did you have a whole nother book that you didn't share, you cocksucker? (laughs) Snorri just (laughs) out there gatekeeping the real Norse. You (laughs) bastard. You bastard. So that is what I've got with hell, wherein it was definitely a concept where the dead would go. But whether or not it was the place where (laughs) only the evil dead went or only certain souls went or it was cold and icy. Big shrug. Who's to say? Who's to say? Well, Snorri will tell you. Snorri, yeah. they answer that Snorri question. Snorri will say. Yeah. But, I'll, but like, but like Snorri is a partisan hack at mm-hmm. times. <laughs> uh. or, or at the very least, he had a lot of personal feelings and ideas about these stories that he grew up hearing. And this is the version he wrote down because that was what he knew best. Yeah. There's a game called Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. Hey, yeah, okay. So I never really got around to beating it. Okay, but you played I'm it. I'm very bummed out about that because honestly, it is a lot of fun, mm-hmm. but I just haven't gotten around to beating a lot of games recently. Mm-hmm. However, Hella shows up, so does Garm at the very start of the game, and it's on that bridge you mentioned. Yeah. It's really cool. Garm is the keeper, is the guard, mm-hmm. uh, and Hella shows up. Hella's design in this game is fucking sick. <laughs> 
It's also scary when she shows up because she's massive. Ooh, yeah, it's that split right down the middle. It's funny because this the the decay. I just story just says she's like half of her is black, half of her is white. And the decay is a concept that has come later. It's way cooler. I think that's really cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she shows up and the whole game is actually, she. it's uh, Senua is going to the underworld to get her, I want to say lover, but I could be wrong about that. Mm-hmm. Friend, had like close, close male companion. Someone. Yeah. Right. Uh, enough to want to go to hell to get them back. Yeah. Okay. Right. And it's actually about accepting the fact that you cannot get them back. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. So she beats Hell at the end of the game doing that. But Hell also shows up in Smite. I was going to say, where is Smite, DJ? So Hell is is one of the gods that has been around since the actual beginning. Since oh, cool. Alpha, right? She uh-huh. was there at the very start. And her original, des- she has been redesigned since. Mm-hmm. And I assume her kit's also different. So she used to have the split design. Right, half white, half black. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, and it's uh, this is actually my first time seeing the three D model of it. Uh huh. Here's how I've always seen it, like her little card. Okay, yeah, where it's like half, but it's like not split quite. It's more like yeah, more like me- melding into each other. It's kinda, yeah, it's and not sick, like skeletal. Not it's kind of sick. Not gonna yeah. lie, really dope. Yeah, she's cool. So this is her now. She has two forms. She goes from a lighter healing side. To a darker damaging side. That's an interesting choice. Yes. It's also actually a lot of fun to play. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. She's got some really fun skins. I think that this design helped them expand on their ability to do different kinds of skins for her. Mm-hmm. This is her card for her main skin, by the way. Oh, okay. And that's yeah. how you see the... Mm-hmm. Yeah. My favorite skin is Expelled. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, so it, in this skin, she is a... Schoolgirl, mm-hmm. I would like I would say more anime than Japanese. Yeah, it's just an anime like, yeah. kind of schoolgirl. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When she's in her light side, that's what it is. When she's in her dark side, it's like a possessed like ghoul ghost, like huh. you see in those uh, what is it like the creepy pastas or like yeah. the, the, those kinds of games where it's like oh you know uh, there was a, a a girl here who died right mm-hmm. teacher now, now murdered she's a now she's a, now she's a ghost and it's that ghost version of the girl. Okay, it's really fun always screaming <laughs> yeah and when you swap back and forth they fight that's fun yeah uh, let me get to her lore real quick oh please yeah what's the because that, that is so interesting she physically transforms and has the healing and then the damage elements yeah is such a very specific kind of interpretation that i would be very interesting to know where the specifically where the healing element comes from is it because she offers like lodging to those who have died of sickness probably like tell me more Probably just like the take on one side of her is white, so light. One mm-hmm. side of her is black, so dark. Mm-hmm. Uh, but both beautiful and terrible, the goddess hell is the keeper of the dead, lays judgment on souls, and decides who is reborn. She is both sides of two extremes. As of the daughter of Loki, the trickster god, hell's destiny, much like her brothers Fenrir and Jormungandr, was doomed to darkness from the start. Odin, the Allfather, uncovered prophecies that Hel and her siblings would be the source of great calamity resulting in Ragnarok, the battle that would end all things. In an effort to prevent this, he cast each of these three into different realms, not quite a prison, though far from freedom. For Hel, Odin gave her charge of the realm of the dead, specifically those that died of sickness and old age. Mm. For himself, Odin retained Valhalla for those who died in battle. At birth, Hell's face was cast half in shadow and half in light. She was both living and dead, so took immediately and graciously to her new role, gifting Odin with the ravens uh, Hugin and Munin in appreciation. As the spirits of the kind-hearted sick and the elderly were brought to her, she cared for them, gave them comfort, yet though she deemed evil, she mercilessly hurled into the frozen depths of Niflheim. Hmm. Yet, despite Odin's efforts, destiny cannot be averted. Hell's conflicting struggle beneath, between benevolence and malice will force her to one extreme or the other. Oh. A time will come when Hell will fulfill her de- her prophecy, though it is yet unknown if she will be a shadow of darkness or a force of her light. Nice. Okay. That's fun. That's a, so it really falls into the one the element of like, well, according to like prophecies, right? She's going to bring about Ragnarok, but unlike Fenris, Wolf, and Jormungandr, the exact how is not 
a thing. And like when we yeah. talked about Ragnarok, hell doesn't come up at all except for that rooster crows down there. Like in Smite, though, mm-hmm. in Smite, she does whisper in Hades' ear to start Ragnarok. Nice. Uh, in, <laughs> as, uh, as we mentioned in the Ragnarok episode. Yeah, uh, I think I totally have space on this. There is like one passage that says like those of like the when Loki will march on like the in Ragnarok, the denizens of hell will be there with him. So it could be also that concept yeah. where then maybe this is why Odin doesn't send any warriors like, to hell because he doesn't want them you get on the sick and elderly, side. okay? <laughs> yeah, it could be that. Uh, I like that a lot. Since we mentioned Thor a couple of times, Thor, Marvel, Thor, let's talk about Thor Hello. Ragnarok. In Thor Ragnarok, okay, so in the Marvel comics, you have Hela. And she is, you know, queen of Helheim, of the, yep. the Norse land of the dead. And she's often villainous because comic books but sometimes she's just doing her job yeah um but usually she is like a little bit of mal- malicious glee where she's not interested in being helpful uh she is missing a hand that is in fact this uh her right hand this girl named lay l e or leah mm-hmm. l e a h which is just a mix around of hella who uh, now I'm on a side tangent. So she was Kid Loki's friend for a while. Okay. And he left her in the underworld Ooh. with Hela because he knew that the original Loki was about to take over his body and he didn't want anything to happen to her. Fair enough. But also didn't tell her that was what was happening because he physically wasn't allowed to talk to any more than three people. So he didn't tell her. He just left her down there. Sad. Hate to see it. We see her again. And this uh-huh. is actually the reason I wanted to mention uh, Marvel Hela in. Angela, Queen of Hell, Okay. where the warrior Angela, who is Thor's sister, don't worry about it, has to go <laughs> rescue her dead girlfriend, who they learned is in Hell, because that's where, you know, Norse goes. But specifically, they, she was an angel who mm-hmm. was of the Hidden Tinth Realm that crossed Frigga and Odin to the point where they decided all angels who die will be slaves in Hell. Actually, Odin didn't decide this. He just banished the realm. Hidden this Tenth was Realm. Gotta love Marvel, guys. Gets great. And so... They actually believe that angels don't have souls and just disappear. So when Angela finds out that Sarah's in hell, she's like, great, I'm going to go get my girlfriend back. So she does. And Hela's like, I'm not going to let you leave here. So then Angela overthrows her. (laughs) She makes herself queen of hell long enough to say Sarah can leave. And the angels who die are no longer slaves down here. Then she leaves Balder in charge. (laughs) And she and uh, Sarah and Leah all leave. There you go. It's great. Uh, the next time we see Hela, who is no longer queen, she's teaming up with Thanos. I'm not paying attention to that, but <laughs> that's a brief spark notes of, of Marvel comics. comics. And now we're going to swing over into Thor Ragnarok, where while Kate Blanchett does a great job and it's super fun, don't get me wrong, they just decided she was going to be Thor's older sister in this and Odin's daughter. Yeah. S- because, you know, everyone wants to fight. Who over- stood beside Odin for when they were like just stomping on realms. Yeah, they, they have a very like colonial colonizer uh, oh, storyline. Viking stuff. Well, Vikings weren't colonizing. They were just raiding. They were just Viking taking stuff. stuff. They weren't like Rome was colonizing. Rome went and conquered lands and then forced those lands to be Roman. Okay. That's colonization. Vikings just raided shit. So I'm not saying it's better, but it is different. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, the the concept of empire is an interesting theme. And I don't like the fact that they made her Odin's daughter. It's <laughs> A little or, goofy. Yeah, because for no reason. Um, in the Marvel comics, she is traditionally Loki's daughter, but not always the Loki we know. Sometimes a previous look. It's and sometimes they're even like, yeah, the humans believe this. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so and she rolls up and is defeated by Surt in <laughs> the Ragnarok when they let Asgard be destroyed to defeat her. Defeated is a word. I don't know if I would have used it because I haven't seen this movie in a while. I always read it as they were just stuck in a stalemate now. <laughs> That's true. Forever Battle is pretty good. So they could pull her out whenever they wanted. Now, the actual reason I bring up Thor Ragnarok is so I could talk about Marvel What If. Because in the second... I haven't watched season two, so... Oh. Well, watch. Say it. Okay. I just so they do, they do a... Instead of locking Hela up in some unnamed prison where, you know... She's yeah. trapped until Odin dies. Uh, he pulls a Thor Ragnar. He pulls a Thor on her, 
wherein he takes her helmet <laughs> and is like, you don't get these powers anymore and casts her down to earth where she, you remember Shang-Chi? Yes. So the dude with the 10 rings, <laughs> she falls in with him and he's uh. very enamored with her, this warrior woman. And she just wants the 10 rings. And things break bad. So then she ends up in that secret paradise place where Shang-Chi's mom is from. Okay. Now, this is way back in ancient, ancient China, yeah, though, yeah. right? So she ends up training with them and getting their powers. But then Odin is going to declare war on the, the guy with the ten rings and all of them because he thinks they killed Hela. Okay. And she's like, well, that's not great. I probably should go stop that. So she does. And this is the Odin who is still like a conqueror of worlds. Yeah. So he sucks. And when Hell's like, I'm alive, don't do this, he's really shitty to her. Anyway, they end up defeating Odin. She gets, because it also is, oh, they be worthy. So Hela has to prove she's worthy to get her helm back. And then she does. Yeah, but this is like conqueror Odin worthy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's kind of weird. Um, I liked the episode because it was fun and weird. I like what if because it's fun and yeah. weird. Um, but then Hela does get her helmet. She and the dude is at the Ten Rings. And I can't remember his name. I'm so sorry. They do defeat Odin. And they're going to go free all... They're going to go... They go declare war on Asgard to free all of the worlds that Odin has conquered. Because she's... Her arc is... Because she was with the other people realized, ah, maybe I wasn't the best person. Yeah. And so now, obviously, her outfit, instead of being black and green, is gold and white. Nice. And it's wild. Thor doesn't show up in this one because Odin doesn't bang Frigg anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> it's also unclear about if Hela is... Frey, Frigg's daughter or not? Don't don't know. Who knows? Don't know. Don't care. Not gonna worry about that too much. It's messy. Yeah. But that's very fun, and the fact that they made her Odin's daughter and Thor's over older sister means they just kind of erase being able to bring Angela in, and that's why I'm salty about it. <laughs> you may have noticed fair I made enough. a point to talk about Angela before I even got into the Hella stuff proper. Yeah, fair enough. That's how salty I am. It's a little goofy, a little silly, a little silly. Do you want to talk about hell? Like, as a place? We can. Yeah, I mean, just because we we don't have... I mean, there's another thing. It's like, here are, like, I think the three things we mentioned are, like, the three big things with hell, Hela. So, did you want to talk about any of your favorite interpretations of hell? Because we had that conversation where it's like, it's not the Norse hell, but it's become so intrinsic with the idea of Christian hell. Or is that something we should save for some future... Well, I mean, we kind of talked about it when we had our Underworld episode, I feel. But our Underworld episode was kind of a hodgepodge mess nowadays. <laughs> back on it. I think also the one Underworld where I was specifically trying to find things that were not hell-like and did have True. those True, that's players. right. That is yeah. something that I do. Um, I'm a big fan of Doom Eternal's Hell. Really? Is uh, that a planet? <laughs> uh, uh, no. Okay. Question mark. Okay. Uh, it's really more along the lines of there is a portal within Mars that goes to hell. <laughs> Why? I don't know. I just know you shoot yourself into Mars as a bullet uh -huh. and you blow a hole into the into the surface of Mars. <laughs> Damn. Okay. There's the line from uh, your fucking scientist AI that's like, you can't just blow a hole into the surface of Mars and then you go... Uh, if I'm to a space station that's circling Mars with a big fuck off railgun and blow a hole in the surface of Mars and then shoot yourself out of that same railgun. Yes, you it's can. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the Doom games. Uh huh. Super excited for Doom Dark Ages. Nice. I want to talk about Adventure Time for a second. Okay. Because you've got the Nidosphere, which is a very traditional, like, Christian concept of hell with fire and brimstone and demons. But it's not the underworld. But it's not the underworld. Is no, why I specifically like wanted to talk about it. Two realms of the underworld, and to get to the forty second, you have to reach Nirvana within the other realms of the underworld. That's actually was specifically it's really why I wanted, funny. That's why I wanted to talk about the adventure, zone, <laughs> the adventure time in this context of this specific episode of Hell and Hell, um, because you have the nightosphere, but that's not an afterlife. That's just fire and brimstone, and then you have their actual afterlives where we see in together again, where it's all these different layers, and there's like the bummer layer. Oh, there's a, there's a ton of bummer layers. Are yeah, you kidding me? But by and large, so I just want to talk about that because I like that it did both. But they are very distinct and separate. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think anybody who dies actually does go to the Nidos. No, because do, it's not. But it's full of demons. It's full of, because the, but it's also simultaneously the Nidosphere is a physical place you can just travel into. Yeah. Whereas the people can open portals into. Yeah. And you can only op uh, open a portal into the afterlife with like demon, like dark magic, not yeah. demon magic. 
like dark magic that peppermint butler now yeah 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 uh, but yeah i just want to bring because i also like the fact that also did like here's a place you can physically go but then also there is the ethereal concept of death where you can't just travel there yeah it's a lot of fun mm-hmm. big fan of together again such a oh, good so ending to the series good. I want to talk about the Warrior Cats just real quick. Okay. Since we're talking about afterlife Darren's stuff. old RP days. Shut up. No, the books. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That too, I guess. So you have the idea of these are cats that live in clans, and they have a concept of the afterlife. And usually it means you go to Star Clan, and that's where all their ants... It's where they end this kings of our past. I think the bears did that too. Yes. But they also have a place where it's essentially the hell, where the evil cats go. And it's just the dark forest. And it's just dark and cold, and there's no sunlight except for this eerie glowing green. And it's just you wander alone forever. Okay. And why is there a hell in the cat book? Because you got to teach your readers, don't be bad or you'll wander alone forever. <laughs> I mean, yes, there's a morality. Listen, the, listen, you, oh, it's the cat book. Oh, Darian liked the cat book. There was the big bad in the book who was killed at the beginning of the last book in the original series by this newcomer who just rolled up and slit his fucking throat. Nice. He was a leader cat. He had nine lives and he lost all of them because, and I remember this line from when I was 12 goddamn years old. Some things even Star Clan can't heal. <laughs> what the fuck? Hell yeah. Yeah, no, I read Seekers. Yeah, you read the bear one. I read the bear one. Yeah. Big fan of that. Nice. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, there's a lot of the supernatural, good omens, hells. They're like, ah, I don't know if I want to talk about hell anymore. I think I mostly just want to talk about Adventure Time and how I like that it balanced both. But. Yeah, Adventure Time was good. Mm-hmm. Big fan of Adventure Time. I'm um, trying to think of other... Uh, uh... I guess maybe it would have been more beneficial to look up specific multi-kind of afterlifes, wherein... Should we have talked about Ran and the places where the other souls go? Maybe a more dedicated episode. To like, here's where all of the souls go when they supposedly I think, die. I think we Be- could talk about it. Yeah, a more dedicated episode of, like, afterlifes. Yeah. like Because, like, I mean... There's a lot. There's at least three of those that I can name off the top of my head. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So Cause it's, cause, oh yeah, because you have. Well, maybe maybe we'll branch into that when we get to Folk Wagner, because that's also a, not just another afterlife where certain warriors go, but mm-hmm. under certain conditions. Yeah. So maybe when we get that one, we'll tack into like Ran, who's the goddess where the drowned souls go. And I saw one where it's like a goddess who looks after those who died when they were virgins. I just saw this briefly okay. in my research. I didn't dig into that. But maybe when we get to that episode, I'll also do a roundup. With the of Vikings, the... does it matter if they were male or female? <laughs> I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> All right. Uh, this multi-tiered of how the idea of just the Adventure warriors... time slots in fucking great there. Then <laughs> mm-hmm. the idea of like it just the Valhalla is for the warriors, and then hell is for the wicked. But maybe it's for the sick and dying. But maybe it's actually for everybody else. But also maybe if you drown, you go here. But also maybe like I. I think that'd be that could be a full episode where we really dig into all of that. Yeah. But for now, I think I think this is as much as I can handle currently. <laughs> Dear listeners, you may be thinking, but wait, what about that pin in Balder? Well, Balder's a big enough episode in and of itself. I we'll be think. talking about him next time. So we'll be talking about him next time. We'll be back in your ears on July second to talk about Balder. Woo! But until then, don't be like Zeus. Don't be like Zeus. Muses of Mythology is created and hosted by Darren and DJ Smart. It's edited by Darren Smart. The show is produced by Darren and DJ Smart, as well as... Tim O'Connor. The Crystal Conman. Nicholas Miller. Our music is Athens Festival by Martin Hay. And our cover art is by Audrey Miller. You can find her at on Instagram at bombshell nutshell art. Want more Muses of Mythology? Support the show on Patreon. Just $1 gets you exclusive bonus content. Get more at patreon.com forward slash muses of mythology. You can also support the show by leaving a review at lovethepodcast.com forward slash muses of mythology or tell a friend why you love the show. Don't forget to check out all of our episodes and episode transcripts at musesofmythology.com. Thanks for listening.